for you. And uh, we, you're going to need it because we're going to go right through the scriptures here as we do at Kumalani Chapel, verse by verse. And we're in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. And I'm going to read the section to you, but I want you to see it as I read through it. I want you to see the Word of God. So if you need that Bible, just hold your hand up. We got one for you. Anyone else need a Bible? You need a Bible? We'll get one for you. Great. Okay, here we go. You got James chapter 2? Got verse 14? Here we go. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or... See, that's so good. Out of the mouths of babes. Okay, let's take another offering and go home. That's, that's all we need. No. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead. Father, this morning, this is a powerful section of Scripture. It's a heavy section of the book of James. It's caused a lot of controversy. It's um, disturbed a lot of people. And yet, Lord, I think the message of it is so practical for us today as a church that we would search ourselves, that we would examine ourselves to see if our faith is alive and vibrant. Oh, God, please. We don't want to have dead faith that's good for nothing. We want living faith that brings forth good fruit, that people might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So, Lord, grab our thoughts, grab our attention. Speak to each one here. And I'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, if you know anything about church history, you know that this section of James' epistle got him into all kinds of problems with the Reformers, and particularly with Martin Luther himself. He called James' epistle a right, straw epistle. I have no idea what that means. <clears throat> but I do know this, it's not good. And he called it that because of his assertion here that faith without works is what? It's dead. <clears throat> now, as most of you know, Luther was fighting the battle for faith and faith alone as the way of salvation. It was not faith plus the church or faith plus the sacraments or faith plus any kind of religious works or faith plus a Wren Spooner Hawaiian shirt that got a person saved. It was faith in Christ alone. And of course, Luther's main champion here was the Apostle Paul. And his great argument from the book of Romans, where he says, the just shall live by what? And those who are justified by faith and faith alone will have peace, of, peace with God. Now, Paul went on to expand upon this thought in the book of Ephesians when he said this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, in this, Luther was absolutely correct. It is faith in Christ and his finished work alone that saves a person, period. And that would seemingly put Paul and Luther at odds with James when he says that faith without works is dead. Now, let me tell you why this is not true. James and Paul are talking about two different things. Paul is talking about how a person gets saved. James is talking about how a believer should live after they are saved. Paul is talking about the very beginning of a believer's life, the point of salvation. James is talking about what happens from that point on. To put this in theological terms, Paul is talking about justification. James is talking about sanctification. So James' whole thrust here is not how does a person get saved, but how does a saved person live? 
And that's not just his thrust in this section. That's his thrust throughout this whole book. He wants us to examine ourselves to see if we are truly saved. And you see, folks, this is really good. This is something that we should be doing. It was Socrates who said, an unexamined life is not worth living. That's true. Not, not just for everyone, but it's, it's particularly true for the believer. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 11. He was talking about taking communion. He said, before you do, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. David put it this way in Psalm 139. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, David was not going to let his life go unexamined. In his epistle, James is doing the same thing. He's forcing us to examine ourselves to see if we're living out our salvation. And particularly in our text today, he wants us to examine the nature of our faith. He wants us to see if our faith is active, living, vibrant, or if it's dead and useless. And folks, i, I got to tell you straight up, this takes guts. It's not easy to examine our faith, our salvation, to see if it's real. Far easier to rattle off some Christian talking points that relate to salvation or to point to our church upbringing or our church affiliation. We're going to talk about our conversion experience. We, I was saved at Billy Graham event. I was saved at Harvard State. I was saved in the tent with Chuck Smith, which is what most of us want to do. But James is forcing us here to prove our faith, not by what happened in the past, but by how we're living right now. He's asking for current examples of a vibrant, living Faith. And let me cut to the chase here. If your faith is alive and vibrant, there will be evidence of it in your life. There will be good fruit in our lives. If our faith is dead, there will be an obvious lack of fruit in our lives. James wants us to be fruit inspectors in our own lives. And so he says in verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? Oh, don't miss the way that James puts this here. He says, is there any value at all in faith that has no outward fruit? Can that kind of faith save him? Now, the way this is set up grammatically in the Greek, th there's only one way this question can be answered, and that is no. James doesn't leave any other options. James is saying a person can talk about their faith all they want, but if they have no good works, no good fruit in their lives to back it up, that's not really saving faith. The point being that if a person is truly saved, there will be life changes. There will be good works. There will be works of charity. There will be priority shifts that will show forth in their salvation. In other words, there's going to be a transformation in the life of someone who is born again. And folks, isn't that true? Shouldn't that be the case? Sure it is. And this isn't just James's point here. For example, John the Baptist repeatedly said that people should show forth the reality of repentance by excellence of deeds. Jesus said that regenerate people should live in such a way that the world would see their good works and do what? Glorify their Father in heaven. In the parable, the sower and the seed, what's the proof that the seed has fallen onto the good ground? What's the proof? It's fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Even Paul made this point. We said that every believer will one day stand before the Bema seat of Christ and they'll be rewarded for the good works that they've done while in the body. Listen, the clear message of the New Testament is that real faith works. It makes a difference in our lives. I like the way John Corson put this. He said it's not faith plus works or faith or works. It's faith that works. Isn't that good? Real faith, saving faith is going to work. It's going to produce good fruit in our lives. Now, to make sure we understand this, 
and exactly what kind of fruit and good works James is thinking of here, he gives us another great illustration. And again, some commentators believe this was written as if James had actually seen this happen or heard about this happening in one of the churches. He says this in verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Now, that doesn't require much commentary, does it? I'm going to give it to you anyway. The scene here is of another church service. Church is over. Everyone's out fellowshipping, drinking coffee, throwing down donuts, eating some of Kirk Hunt's chili and rice. They're out there having a grand time. And here's this person. And yes, they're a brother or sister. Did you notice that? We've worshiped together. We've heard the word of God together. Now, maybe someone's even given them a donut and a cup of coffee or some chili and rice. And they're eating now, but now it's, it's time to leave. Everyone's beginning to drift away. And oh yeah, you, you know they have food now, but if they're going to eat again tonight, they need to go down to Lahaina to the Salvation Army. And you realize that their clothes are dirty because they're the clothes that they sleep in. You realize even though it's summer and it's warm now, there's still raining up here, and those clothes aren't going to keep them cozy and warm. But you rationalize it by thinking, well, maybe they could hit the thrift store on the way down, or maybe they have some other clothes hidden in the bushes along the way somewhere. And so when you leave, you say to them, hey, God bless you. Great to be with this morning. Great worship with you. See you next week. Hey, brother, be warmed. Be filled. And you go your way without providing any of the things that you know that they need. James says that kind of faith is not just useless. It's what? It's dead. Folks, you've got to get this. I have got to get this. There's a faith that we can have. It looks good. It sounds good. It does the right religious things. But it's dead. How do we know it's dead? Because it doesn't respond to the voice of the Spirit. It isn't moved by the heart of God. It has no desire or capacity to walk in the good works that Jesus has set before us every day. And folks, that's the point here. What we have in this illustration, it's a divine appointment. It's a divine opportunity to be about your father's business. He dropped it right in front of you. I mean, you could pay for for this person. You could lay hands on them and pray for their needs. That would be wonderful. You could give them a little money. You could bring that person to your house for dinner. You could bring some food down to them to where you know that they hang out. You could take them by savers and make sure they have some good clothes. I mean, by doing any of those things, you'd show forth the love of God. You'd show forth their mercy and the grace of God. You'd extend the hand of fellowship in a very powerful way, but you don't. And you don't because your faith is dead to all these things. And because your faith is dead, you can walk away from a brother or sister who is in need, and you cannot feel a thing. Folks, dead people have no feeling, no conscience. They're dead. And folks, if your faith is dead, you're not born again, is what James is saying. You're, you're not saved. If your faith doesn't respond to the voice of the Spirit or to the heart of God or to the good works that Jesus has before us, it's not saving faith. It's just that simple. Now, you might think you're saved. You, you might have prayed the prayer, maybe even at a Billy Graham crusade. But the reality is you're not saved. The, the fruit of salvation is just not there. So James is saying, examine yourself. If you were presented with this opportunity, and all of us have, how would you respond? Would your actions prove that your faith was alive and vibrant? Or would your actions prove that your faith really is dead? Folks, that's a, it's a good question. It's a hard question. It's a question I've been wrestling with myself all week long. How do I respond? Living faith? Dead faith. Well, th there's a real practical application to this as well. 
You know, I talk to gals all the time who come to me, and they're, they're all excited. Oh, Pastor Ricky, I met a guy. They love to tell their pastor that, you know. My first question to them is, well, is this guy a believer? Is he born again? Oh, pastor, he is. When I told him I was a Christian, he said, praise the Lord. Me too. Well, my next question is, does he act like a Christian? Oh, pastor, you know, you can't judge people. Judge not lest you be judged, you know. Well, you see, I'm not judging this guy. I'm just looking for fruit, which is exactly what Jesus and James and Paul ask us to do. We are called to be fruit inspectors of ourselves and of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So tell me some of the fruit in this guy's life that proves to you he's a believer. Does he go to church? Does he have Christian friends? Is he in a life group? Is he involved in some kinds of ministry? Does he love the Word of God? Is his heart to keep you from sin? Do you see evidence of his faith? that it responds to the voice of the Spirit, the heart of God, and the good works that God sets before him. You see, if so, the guy's a believer. Praise the Lord. If not, run for the hills. <laughs> That's a prophetic word for some of you gals here this morning. <laughs> run for the hills. He's going to rip you off. See, so you have every right to check people out to see if their faith is living and vibrant or if it's dead. We are to examine ourselves. We are to examine those around us. We don't want dead faith. Now, I love what James does next here. It's like he anticipates the argument that's going to come back from this. And so he says in verse 18, but some will say, oh, well, I have faith and you have deeds. James says, Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. See, James is anticipating kind of a laissez-faire response here. Ah, oh, faith works. You, know, you like one. I like the other. Who cares? It's kind of an I'm okay, you're okay kind of deal. Your emphasis and your life is on faith. Mine is on works. But we're all going to get to heaven. But James fires back. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith. How? By my works. Folks, this is a great argument. Is there any way to demonstrate faith without works? Church, think about. Think about this. You can talk about your faith, but is there any way to actually prove that you have faith in Jesus Christ without pointing to what you do or what you don't do? I don't think so. And James doesn't think so. So James says, you can talk about your faith all you want. I'll prove my faith by what I do, which is exactly what Jesus said that we should be doing at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, here's the way you'll be able to identify the true believer. You will know them by their, see what it says? That's a little slow. It's coming. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus says, you'll know that there are people of faith by the fruit you see in their lives. If they're born again, they'll produce good fruit. If they're not born again, they will not. We need to be fruit inspectors. Now, the point being in all this is that we just can't discount this discussion of faith and works. We can't brush it aside. It's something we can't just take or leave. We need to examine ourselves and see, am I in the faith? Which brings up another argument, which is the argument of orthodoxy as the measure of our faith. You see, the man who has no works to back up his faith might come back at James and say something like this. Well, you want to see proof of my faith apart from works? Here it is. It's my orthodoxy. I may not have a bunch of good works in my life, but I believe the right things and I defend the right things, so I know I'm saved. We had an interesting discussion of our life groups. A gal spoke up and said, you know, when we were young, and at one point we were young, it was good. But when we were young, you know, it was all about what we did for the Lord. We were so, we were so excited. So excited that we were saved. 
And we, we just couldn't stop talking about it and going out, proclaiming who he was, mission trips. We wanted to go. We wanted to do it. And that's one of the things I love about the young people in our church today. Think about the Great Commission team, the, the GCT, the effort they put into evangelism in our community. It's wonderful. The mantra of young people today is don't tell me how I can give. Tell me what I can do. I love that. And because of that, we're seeing young people touch our community and touch our world. It's great. But as you get older, it becomes less and less about what you do and more and more about what you believe. We believe the right things. We're totally orthodox in our faith. We can sniff out soft, uh, false teaching and doctrine a mile away, and we're not afraid to take it on. And so we think that our faith is proven by our orthodoxy. And that gives us a pass on the good works that God wants us to do. And so your good work now becomes coming to church to critique the pastor. <laughs> to make sure he's right on or not, right? Now what James is going to tell us here is that orthodoxy is not a good proof of our faith. And here's why. Look at verse 19 in your Bibles. You believe that there is one God. You do well. But even the demons believe, and they tremble. Now, is James going for a little shock value here? Well, sure he is, but he's right on in doing it. Remember the context here. He's talking to Jewish believers. And they believe that what set them apart from all of the people group was that they knew that the Lord, their God, was one God. Every day they would say the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One God, Deuteronomy 6. They took great pride in their orthodoxy in this manner. But James comes right back and says, hey, you believe that God is one? That's great. But the demons believe that too, and they tremble. In other words, the demons are perhaps a little more orthodox even than you. And you know that that faith doesn't save them, and it doesn't. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, you're thinking, oh, James is just kidding here, right? The demons don't really believe that God is one. They don't care about these things. They're not interested in these things. Well, the answer is that the demons, those fallen angels who are here on earth tormenting and tempting believers, those unclean spirits who are keeping the unsaved locked up in chains of unbelief are way more orthodox than most people in our congregation today. Do they know and understand the nature and power of God? Oh, folks, you bet they do. They've seen God face to face. They were there when God spoke the universe into being. Do they understand the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on the cross? They watched from the spiritual realm as the wrath and judgment of God came upon Jesus Christ for the sins of the world. They witnessed with their own eyes that the power of death could not hold him down. Oh, they know exactly what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Do they believe in hell? Oh, you bet they do. They know the lake of fire was created just for them. Do they believe in the final judgment? Again, they know their leader, Satan, has already been judged, and theirs is coming. Do they believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again? They're counting down the days, because when he does, their time is over. Now, see, we kind of understand the nature and power of God. We kind of understand the salvation that Jesus purchased on the cross. We're pretty sure there's a hell, a lake of fire, and a final judgment. We're pretty convinced that Jesus will come back at some point. All these things do impact our lives to a certain degree. But, folks, when the demons think about these things, they tremble. These truths rock them down to the core of their being. They're way more orthodox. They're way more believing than most of us. And yet, their orthodoxy does not save them. Nor will our orthodoxy save us if it's not tied into living faith. Listen, I've met people. They know the Bible inside and out better than I ever will. They can tell the difference between Calvinism, Arminianism, they could, they, could, they could defend both sides of eternal security and the believer's ability to lose their salvation. They can draw lessons from church history that would blow your mind, and yet they are as lost as all get out. They have no relationship with God at all, and yet they believe their orthodoxy, their much learning, is going to save them. It won't, just like it won't save the demons, just like it won't save us. See, saving faith has nothing to do with going to the right church, carrying the right Bible, knowing the right creeds, believing the right doctrines. It has everything to do with living, vibrant faith that heeds 
the voice of the Spirit that responds to the heart of God, that has that desire to walk in the good works that Jesus sets before you every day. See, that, that's why we at, Cal, at Kumulani Chapel do things like Harvest America and Camp Kumulani and our Thanksgiving outreach. Yeah, we we want to teach the Word. We want you to know the Word. But more than that, we want to give you a place to put your faith into action. And these are opportunities for you to exercise your faith. I mean, Harvest America in a couple weeks, that little prayer thing. See, we're giving you a chance to stretch your faith, to exercise your faith. And we're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep giving you opportunities because we want your faith to grow. We want it to be strong. We want it to expand. We want West Maui to see your good works and to glorify your Father in heaven. Now, not that we don't get criticized for doing this and all the stuff that we do. I had a guy tell me that Kumalayan Chapel, all we're about here is programs. He didn't want to be another worker bee that helped us pull off those programs. So he goes to another church. And that's true. We do have a program here. Did you know that? Here it is. We want to see people on our island and our world come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We want to see those people discipled in Christ. We want to see them sent out so they can impact their world for Jesus. Now, does it take people to pull off that program? Oh, yeah, yeah it does. Is it hard work to pull off that program? Yes, it is. But is it what we're supposed to be doing? Folks, I believe it is. I, I believe it lines exactly up with what James is saying here. We are demonstrating our faith by the good works that we're doing. Now, when I was in Santa Barbara, I had another guy come up to me. He introduced himself to me. And he said he was from another church in Santa Barbara. And he said, uh, you guys are the doing church, and we are the being church. I said, wow, really? He said, yeah, and I really appreciate what you guys do and all you're doing, but we think that being is just Im is important, and I'm really happy to be part of the being church. Now, I understand what this guy is saying. Religious works are no substitute for a real relationship with God. But the message of James here is that a real relationship with God will always result in doing. It's never one or the other. The one flows out of the other. Again, back to John Corson. It's not faith plus works or faith or works. It's faith that works. Vibrant, saving faith. It's going to produce good fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. So as you examine yourself today, and remember, an unexamined life is not worth living. So as you examine yourself today, is there fruit in your life? Are there good things flowing from your life because you've been born again? Does your faith heed the voice of the Spirit? Does it respond to the heart of God? Does it have a desire to walk in the good works that Jesus has set before you every day? The good news is that for so many of you, it does. It does. And I love it. I love the fruit that I see in our church right now. I love it. It's exciting to see. If you don't see that good fruit in your life, folks, it can change right here this morning. You can leave from here being one who says, God, I am going to heed your voice. I'm going I'm to follow the heart of God. I'm going to take advantage of those divine opportunities you put before me. So, Father, now as we uh, head towards communion, Lord, this is a, it's a very challenging section of Scripture. This is not for the faint of heart. Lord, th this is for those that they, they want to go deeper with you, God. And Lord, I, I have to confess, sometimes I don't, I don't want to go deeper. I'm kind of happy where I am. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you just will not leave me there. You won't do it. And so by your word, you challenge me. It's like you swim underneath me and you grab my ankles and you kind of tug me down another 10 feet. Wow. Here's where I want you to be. And Lord, part of that is examining myself. Really, really, not defending myself, not spouting off some 
Christianese, but Lord, really examining myself. And I know now, Lord, as we go into communion today, that's the clear command of Scripture, that we are to examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith. And that's why communion is only for believers. And if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, hey, you know, listen, no shame. Just let, that, just let it pass. That's great. But if you are a believer today, would you take just a, a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, and will you examine yourself and say, God, is my faith as living and active as you want it to be? Is the fruit in my life what you want it to be? Am I really producing fruit? Is there really transformation going on inside of me? And then, Lord, if we really want to go deep, we say, but Lord, is there more you want to do? <laughs> Can my faith be more active? Can there be more fruit? Lord, lead me into that. So, Father, I thank you that this time of communion is so personal, so powerful. So as we do take communion, Lord, speak now to each one. Just, Lord, you and them. You and them. As they hold those elements, Jesus, you come. You speak to them. In Jesus' name. Amen. The ushers are going to come forward now. We're going to pass out the elements. You're going to hold on to them because my good friend Lance Ralston, pastor of Calvary Chapel from Oxnard, is going to come up and actually lead us in communion this morning. So uh, hold on to the elements, and we're going to take them together. So men, would you go ahead? And let's worship while those elements are being passed.